We're going to roll here. We've got uh, Stephen Weigel. Um, super stoked that Stephen was able to visit him and drink with us from the Midwest. Um, I met Stephen at camp a couple years ago and uh, sort of blew our minds with him. Also, Seth Deary, he's developed that a little bit further and he's going to now throw it at you and see what you can throw back. So, um, Format is, 
that's open to change. I like have all the places in my paper or bar tour I use that term, and I'm like ready to change it if a better one comes up. Because uh, I find that when I deal with this area, there's a lot of things that don't have names that are like super important. So, for example, uh, in a diatonic scale, if we have 5L2S, well, the 5 and the 2 themselves don't have names. I asked a lot of people about it, and they like, gave me different funny variables. So I'm choosing to call those coefficients for now. Um, and later we'll get to something called coefficient types that's very, very uh, important for enumerating purposes, uh, I hope. I'm so. assuming LS is large and small. Yeah, LS is large and small, right? Sorry if I didn't make that clear. Yeah, and often the they're actually written in a large and small manner as well. Like the L is written as a capital and the S is written as a lowercase. So that's basically the situation there. And then like the M thing is not standard. So I I did a thing for a while where I was like writing a big M and then a little M and then the little M with the one. If I ever needed five kinds of step sizes, but those tend to not crop up a lot. So. Uh, Okay, now let's really get into the difference between uh, pitch class sets and scalar class sets. You'll see that I'm comparing a host of things, and this is sort of where the important parallel is. So when we have counting, uh, we're counting a certain number of objects, uh, and we're using discrete notes. So the numbers that I'm giving are the names of the notes themselves, and that's what a pitch class set is. So like, you know, here's a 12 tone equal tempered clock face, and we can draw a major scale here. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Hey, look, there it is. Um, and then what we could do is we could also draw it over here, but instead we're measuring the steps between the notes. So that's the main difference here. We have these measurements that measure adjacent intervals. And in sex singing class, it's actually, it's interesting because some people do the left version, some people do the right. That is. Uh, you could choose a key and start on the left, and then each note has a consistent number that you always sing. So uh, that's also known as um, mixed do, uh, or movable do, based on what key you're singing, and maybe you're not singing in C. But then to the right, you can also sing uh, adjacent intervals, uh, which would be the ones that happen in between. So uh, then the way we label those with numbers is as follows. We just label the numbers themselves. <coughs> Sorry. with um, uh, with the numeral that they're on just in the equal temperament. So if this is mod 12, uh, anything that goes to 12 uh, will be equal to 0. Anything that goes to 13 will be equal to 1, etc. And then over here, we can just label these as step sizes. So you can see that this is, in fact, 5L2S because we have 5 2s and 2 1s. So does everyone see that? Good. I think everything's going well then. Can I ask a dumb question? Yeah, you can. So this is probably because I you're assuming some knowledge that I don't fully possess. But right, I don't, I don't know how, like, where everyone is. Right. Yeah. So I understand with, like, the 5L2S, there's, like, five large and two small steps. But yeah. one thing I didn't quite understand is why it sort of, like, gets rid of the orders. Like, you can rearrange those steps in many ways, but obviously the major scale has a particular ordering of those that makes sense. So for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah, I keep saying that, but, yeah. We talked about kinds of things, so that's proof that we are going to talk about your thing, too. So, yeah. Okay, so there's that. Uh, now, uh, a few important facts. Uh, a scalar class set is just what I call a fixed number of any given you know, group of L's, S's, M's, whatever. It's not talking about the order. Um, usually when microtonalists refer to a group of L's and S's, they are sort of inferring the moment of symmetry scale, which is a specific uh, permutation, but not a specific mode. Uh, so from the most possibilities to the least possibilities, we have permutations, normal orders, and then prime forms. So permutations would just be saying, OK, if I have five L's and two S's, how can I just write that? Uh, with any combinations of L's and S's, how many different ways can I write that? Uh, and then if normal orders makes a reduction where it takes away uh, anything where the letters are in the same order, but it's a different mode of it. Like how we were cycling earlier with the major triad, we can do that with scales. Uh, and then prime forms is an even further reduction that sort of seems to be a lot more exclusive to pitch class sets. It's actually very annoying mathematically with scalar class sets. But normal orders are a lot easier. So now let's talk about how to write out those different orders. Um, so first I want to go over two different ways to arrange the scalar class set. 
Uh, one different way is to just change the mode. So cycling around a mode means that I'm taking uh, the pitch space and I'm just twisting it around. Uh, and whenever a pitch space lines up with itself, uh, we can call that transpositionally symmetrical. Uh, I'm not sure what you call it in the microtonal world. I guess you'd say some of those scales have um, non-octave periods, a lot of them. Um, but anyway, let me twist this around, so watch the circle. I hope it's going to twist around. Hey, there we go. So now we just took it and we just twisted it that way. Uh, and now what I've done is I've just scooted that top thing over. Uh, I've written the L's and S's in a certain order that correspond to that circle. And I'm going to take that last S and I'm just going to put it at the beginning since we turn the circle around and our beginning note is now different. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. So I'm going to do that now if the animation works. Hey, look at that. Thanks, it worked. Uh, so now, uh, that order of L's and S's is how I would describe the circle because we always describe things from the top note. And then, of course, going around the clock face tends to be an R. But it could be whatever you wanted uh, if you had some different mathematical uh, instincts. So there's that. All right, now the second way to rearrange, oh, I did one more, just to illustrate that I can do it again and again. And I can do it seven times because I've got seven notes there uh, and seven intervals too. And things don't overlap at all because there's no transpositional symmetry. Are you calling large anything more than one or two? Large is two here, but it could be any number if we were using a different tuning system. Um, so, yeah, large is just two in this specific case. But it's always the same number in whatever tune you're looking at, like an L. Right, all the L's are the same. On a regular piano, yeah, there's only one possibility of just two. Yeah, yeah, like, let's say you wanted your L to be 3, and you wanted your S to be 1. Well, you'd have 17 tone equal temperament instead. So the spacing is just a little bit different. Um, so that's kind of the idea. You're not talking about sharps and flats. Right, yeah, sharps and flats don't have to be here. They can, but, you know, they don't... <laughs> I'm just wondering, right is there an assumption what large means and small means, or do you, do you uh, identify that every time? Oh, um, you can assume that they just equal each other and you don't have to write those as numbers. So like if I say 5L2S, I could just be referring to uh, any values of L or S that would logically make sense. Well, you, are, you are assuming that if you write LS, LLS, LL, yeah. those steps fill up the octave. Right. And so whatever yeah. numbers make that happen is... So and if you're in, basically, if you're on a regular piano... We're basically in the Edo or Edo Noe. Uh, not active uh, interval. So yeah. basically there's only a certain number of spots in the circle. And right, like you're saying, you you skip some and you need to take a big step or a little step as you go around as you go up the scale or around the circle. Right. right. Like um, do you know what cents are? I assume you do. Yes. Maybe. Okay. There's twelve hundred cents in an octave and then if you go up a semitone, that's just a hundred cents. So it's a really easy way to think about how we hear notes adjacently. So uh, if we have 1,200 notes in an octave, you could actually describe the L's and S's as set values, and they would just all have to add up to 1,200. So uh, that would mean that if we made one change in like a large step, the small steps would have to change accordingly. Like let's say we wanted to make the large step one cent bigger, because normally it's 200 and 12 tone equal temperament. So let's say we wanted to make the large step 201 cents. Right, which is going to be a change. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, all those are 201, and since we have five large steps, well, now we have five cents less in that octave, so we would just have to divide that in half and make the small steps correspondingly 2.5 cents smaller each, so that it would still fit, if that makes sense. So you would have a key on whatever you would write, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's usually, it's, if, if there's a, a need to specify, like you can talk about these things Generally, like all five right. scales are going to have some things in common, but if you want to specify it for a particular tuning, then you can say, okay, an L is three steps of the tuning, and S is one, or, or whatever. Yeah, or you can even be a jerk and be like 3.7 and 1.94, but nobody does that. <laughs> and, and just to clarify, you, this applies only to tunings where like all the larges are the same, so you wouldn't have, I mean, this have to be by within the, what you're talking about. All the larges are the same. Right, all the larges are the all same. Small. Although it's also useful for scales that maybe are like a hair inaccurate, but really like are trying to be this or something like that. Something like this between 10 to 9 and 9 to 8, like you, 
could sort of use this to talk about that, or not so much. Like the, those would both, both be large. That's where you probably want an M. That's where you want some other qualification. Yeah, I'd say you want to use another qualification. Well, this, it's different for everyone. Yeah. This seems yeah. like it applies more to Edo's, but right. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a big Edo thing. Yeah, I think we too. sadly have to move on. Although this is great that everybody's asking questions to these, like we all want to get on the same page. Okay, let's talk about the second way to rearrange it. Changing the distribution. Now, this has to do with just shuffling around the L's and S's in a different order. It's been mentioned before. So look at this order I have. Oh boy, it's the MOS. How oh, please. Uh, we've got two S's. And since we really only have two of them, we can just kind of shuffle them around and really sort of figure out what would happen, right? Like let's say I just wanted to take that first S and then switch it with the L that's right to the right of it. Then we would have uh, not a clump of two L's and three L's, but we'd have a clump of one L and four L's, right? So we wouldn't have a moment of symmetry anymore. We would have something different. Uh, keep in mind, of course, that I'm sort of counting all of the modes or cycles of one thing as very similar. And that'll be the idea of you know, the permutations uh, that come up. So let's move that S over. Hey, you look at that. We just moved it over. And now we have one L, a clump of one L, and a clump of four Ls instead of three and two. Um, and then I move it over again, and we have, well, a clump of all five Ls. So I guess that's kind of, seems like the opposite of the moment of symmetry to me. But some of the scales get a little bit more complicated with that. Uh, and then I can move the S over and skip that other S, say, and we have the same thing. You can see that if I keep moving the S over, we get the same kind of thing. And so we only really have three ways to change the distribution, right? Or we only have three ways to clump those L's. Uh, but in other scales, that gets more complicated. Just using this one because everybody knows it and it's really familiar. And it's really easy because you can just scoot the S's over and figure it out. Um, so there's that. Um, Doug and I were talking about levels of angularity, and I think we came up with the name most unevenly distributed. So uh, <laughs> for the S's clumping together, we're just calling that the mud. So that is what happens when you just have all the S's in a clump and all the L's in a clump. We haven't really figured out what to do with three step sizes yet. So anyway, you can see how changing the distribution causes the scale to be much more different than just cycling the boat around. So we're interested in this as a unique arrangement, so the theory will reduce the number of permutations by making modes redundant. And this is the important parts. Uh, so here is the permutation. Uh, what happens is you take uh, the total number of coefficients as a factorial on the top, and you divide it by any other individual coefficients you have on the bottom. So for 5L2S, you know, 5 plus 2 is 7, we've got 7 total coefficients, that's on the top. And then on the bottom, we just have 5 and 2. And then if we wanted to add some other random thing, like let's say we wanted 3 middle steps, we could just put a 3 factorial on the bottom, and then get whatever that is. Uh, so that just tells you all the different ways that you can write out uh, your given pattern as a <coughs> string. So there are 21 ways to write five L's and two S's up. Uh, then, in order to reduce it to normal orders, you have to divide it by the number of coefficients there are, which basically like it rid gets rid of the cycles. So like, you know, imagine you've got 21 little strings and then you take one unique string and you move it over seven times. That's what that division accomplishes. So that's telling us that we only have three normal orders. And there they are. Uh, in fact, in 12 tone equal temperament, we have names for these already, which is kind of nice. Uh, heptatonia prima is the diatonic scale. Heptatonia secunda is the ascending line minor scale. And heptatonia tertia is, I guess, Neapolitan major. I don't trust Wikipedia. Um, I've heard some people call that uh, Phrygian Dorian. So, you know, uh, to each his own or her own. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a really big one. I used a computer program to figure out what a lot of these were, and I don't actually have a proof, but I don't need one because this is already a concept from proof theory. So I know that it works perfectly, and I tested it extensively. Uh, this is an example I think of, uh, oh, I guess we've got four L's, three M's, and two S's. So four L, three M, two S. This, all of these different strings, these are all permutations. Uh, these are about one-sixth of the document, maybe, or one-seventh. 
So the numbers can get truly uh, astronomical and disastrous, especially if you add more kinds of step sizes. That really is the kicker. Like having two step sizes usually isn't too bad, but then as soon as you add three, you're dealing with a lot. And then if you have four, you might as well just throw up your hands and be like, well, that's a lot. So there's that. Um, and of course, the program is grouping them by modes, so I could know um, basically that bottom number for the permutation, how many um, unique distributions there are. So you can see that it's grouping it in chunks of 10 because there are 10 uh, different intervals. What's the meaning of the red? Oh, that's just like a computer thinking it's spelled wrong. It's spelled wrong. <laughs> 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 which, which, I don't know why it would do that for like because some they're reason. obviously correct. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like all those would be spelled wrong. But, Duh, oh, man. I don't know. Maybe you just can only handle so much at a time. Okay, great. So we've gotten through that. Does everyone feel like they understand the permutation stuff? Okay, yeah, so that permutation stuff just has to be Michelle too. Now, let me bring up a problem. Here's the problem. You know the octatonic scale, 4L, 4S. When we have that moment of symmetry, and you picture the circle again, sorry I didn't make one, um, we have that little nice octagon, and we can turn it around once, and we have a different scale, but then we turn it around again, and we have a redundancy. So this is the annoying part. Um, dealing with transpositional symmetry involves taking a slightly more complex division because the numbers won't work out. If you think about it, and you just treated 4L, 4S as like a regular thing that didn't have any transpositional symmetry or redundancy when we turn it in a circle, then you would be counting LS, 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 and LS, 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 LS as the same thing, and doing that two more times. So we can't have that. We have to eliminate that. So um, I sort of figured out how to get rid of that through a silly division method, which I'll show a little video clip of. Uh, and there's also inversional symmetry. Uh, but that's only redundant in coming up with prime forms. So really the transpositional symmetry problem is slightly easier and also more important, I think, because the prime forms tend to not be uh, super important. Uh, so with transpositional symmetry, I don't really have to explain this slide too much, um, it just has to do with uh, taking all of the divisions of the thing in question. Uh, so basically you're looking for whether the coefficients are co-prime uh, and if something, you know, if two things are co-prime, that just means that they uh, don't have any factors in common because they're, you know, they come from different prime numbers. So like 5L2S, great example. Uh, 5 is a prime number and so is 2. So those two would be co-prime. If you have things that aren't co-prime, you're going to have transpositional symmetry. So here is a little video where I demonstrate that division method to figure out uh, how many normal orders are in the uh, scalar class set 20L20S. So get ready. Oh, by the way, this is Igor Lieberman's music. This is a Brazilian guy. Oh, nice. Dividing out the redundancies in a very systematic way. So yeah, that's got 
Uh, three billion four hundred forty-six thousand. Yeah. No, no, four hundred forty-six billion one hundred sixty-seven thousand eight hundred sixty-nine words. So just some giant number that uh, a really numerological person could use, I guess. Okay. Uh, now briefly touching on inversional symmetry, that only has to do with the determination of prime form because if you're thinking about comparing inversional symmetry, um, well, comparing inversions of pitch class sets, sorry. Um, then you're considering that when you think of prime form, but you just don't have to consider that at all if you're thinking of the normal orders that come from a scalar class set. So um, if you have a scalar class set and you flip it over, that's inversion. So it would be like, um, you see that LLSSS. It's like I'm just swinging it around an invisible middle axis. I'm just going. So basically, that's just what I've done with the letters. Uh, and just like with pitch class sets, scalar class sets either invert themselves, meaning they're inversionally symmetrical, or they invert to something else that pairs up with that thing. Uh, so that means that you know we can describe the behavior of it and things like that. Uh, so here is an equation that comes from Pascal's triangle that tells you how to do it for scalar class sets that have two different types of step. So L's and S's. So this wouldn't work for LMS or anything higher. Um, but it does work for that. And this basically just comes from uh, the equations for triangular numbers, where t1 and t2, I think, are actually coefficients. But that was before I had renamed such a thing. Um, but yeah, I, I know that looks crazy, but it's not actually too bad. It just has to do with triangular numbers and Pascal's triangle. Um, some other set theory ideas that this can help solve uh, has to do with being able to navigate scalar class sets, many tuning of parsing things up by hand. Uh, that seems really nice. Like, imagine you have a table of pitch class sets, but instead it's a table of scalar class sets. Or a table of scalar class sets where the table of pitch class sets are a sub-hierarchy of that, and you know their exact relation. Well, I have that with 12 equal temperament, because I went through and did it all by hand. Uh, it was really hard work, but I think it really paid off, because I was able to see everything sort of working in real time, uh, getting more confirmation that all the permutations were, in fact, making sense. Um, there's also some more discoveries to be made for sure, uh, like discovering the set theory equation for symmetrical partitions, for people tunings, symmetrical partitions. I don't know why the word symmetrical is in there. Huh. Anyway, um, <laughs> then we can talk about the number of characters the scale has. This is something that I find really interesting. If you've ever played with dynamic tonality, you know that uh, you can slide the L's and S's around to change the values. And we actually discussed this a little bit earlier. But I feel like there are you know, maybe a certain number of slots that each scale can have based on what you consider to be a meaningful chromatic difference. Like I think that 35 cents is a pretty meaningful chromatic difference. So I could use that to say that maybe like 5L2S has like probably six different intonations that would matter to me, things like that. So uh, if you were to think about how many scales could exist and like what your preferred chromatic size is, you could calculate that kind of thing. Um, so that's something that I'm interested in too. And I realize, of course, that that's very subjective, but that's why you need to you know, define your own chromatic difference and things like that. But maybe there could be some other parameters like octave stretch or uh, other kinds of things too. Um, or Tamil stuff, because you know, that can always be funny too. Um, and then there's also um, something called a cutoff equal tuning. Uh, which isn't as related, but has to do with um, the highest equal tuning a certain LS scale can create, or a certain LNS scale. But I really only have it for LS scales. Um, so I'm not really going to talk about the table too much, I guess. I should mention that last bullet point. Um, I may have found a new enumeration. Um, <coughs> it has to do with uh, looking at the coefficients of the scalar class sets without uh, pairing them up to any L's, M's, or S's in general. And I know that seems like a very weird statement, but I think you'll understand when you see the table, I hope. So uh, here's the first part of that table. You can see uh, to the left, this is hopefully familiar to a lot of people who have uh, learned set theory, that's just the table of pitch class sets. So that uh, gives you all the normal orders and then uh, normal orders that pair together to the same prime form are also labeled with like a B next to it. So you can see that there's like, you know, in that red line there, 3, 2, and then there's 3, 2, B, because they invert to each other. 
Um, and then the ones that are inversionally symmetrical, I think, just have an asterisk. So yeah, 3, 1, uh, the 0, 1, 2 classic trimere just inverts to itself because if you just you know flip it over, then it's the same thing. Um, so that's the situation there. Now what I did was, um, the table of pitch class sets, of course, over here, that's already like been known for years and years and years. It's this part that's new. Um, I just figured out what all the scalar class sets would be for every pitch class set. And then I grouped them together by the same one. Because uh, if you have a scalar class set, huh? Oh, yes, we do that. Ah, crap. Okay, let's try. I wonder. Okay, I'm trying all my Zoom commands, nothing's happening. I think I'm going to try doing this, and then I know how to zoom in one back dock from here, wherever everything went. Okay, ah, there you are. Okay, now cave yourself. Okay, let's look at the tricords, shall we? Okay, so here are the tricords. We've got all those tricords. Oh, how wonderful. There being 12 prime forms, how great. Uh, and then the scalar class sets are written out over here, and then put here. Uh, and then these just describe them using uh, L's and S's that you know, don't have any fixed size. So we can group those together. Uh, so like the 1L2S, for example, there's only one of those that's right here. Um, and then with the 1L1 and 1S, well, we have four of those, five, six, seven. We've got seven of those. And those all uh, obey the laws of permutation that I was talking about earlier. So there's sort of like a continuum here where like uh, with the table of pitch class sets, it's at its most specific. And then as we get further and further back, <coughs> things get more general. So this column, which I call the coefficient type, just describes all of the different ways that the coefficients can be partitioned. And those create a new mirror. So that's why I strongly suspect that, that they can be enumerated. And that you could enumerate those and then figure out the table of pitch class sets from that, which would be a little cumbersome, but it would be good in equal temperaments that are really high where like, the number of pitch class sets is just like astronomical and you don't want to deal with it, you know? Um, dealing with scalar class sets would be way better in something like 31 to equal temperament, which, you know, we all have shirts of. So maybe we want this to be a thing. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, so the scalar class sets of tricorps can be partitioned uh, as like a 2, 1. So I'm counting to see both 1L, 2S, and 2L, 1S as a 2, 1, because both of those just have a 2 and a 1. And then, likewise, all these one one ones are just that. And then, of course, there's just the augmented chord. So that's just the three. And then, similarly, that's just P types, but it should say, like, coefficient types. I changed the name because P is confusing because there's permutation and partitions and all the other kinds of things that start P. It's like labeling things in tone. It's just not a good idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you can see that there are four partition types here. And then, if I continue with the presentation mode, uh, you get the idea for the rest of the charts. Uh, and up here, oh, come on. Uh, you see the normal orders and prime forms create a mirror. I'll actually skip to the end of that. So that's just the whole chart I have. And then here, here's sort of the major discovery because the normal orders, um, they form a mirror. You can see that there's, uh, you know, for the null set, obviously, there's just one normal order. Oh, and I got a quick question. So yeah, three, go ahead. three cores, a triad, tri cores, a triad, mm -hmm. and four cores, a tetrad. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I guess you could say tetrachord, but you know, that has other implications. Yeah. I say, uh, I think, I, yeah, I say trichord and tetrachord and pentachord. So, yeah. I think that's kind of the accepted set theory word. So, yeah. Um, cool. So, um, anyway, you can see that this is like a palindrome, and then when you get to the hexachords in the middle, you have this big number, this 80. Uh, and the normal orders and prime forms, again, have been known about for years. But look at the coefficient types. Perfect mirror. So this is what I haven't figured out yet. Now, it is known how to enumerate the normal orders and prime forms. It's just very hard. So probably this is way harder, which is why I haven't figured it out yet. Um, so for the normal orders and prime forms, I actually have this cool little table here. This is a, a 
table from Julian Hook's excellent article, Hook Wired Are 29 Technical Words, which is a great article. I recommend you read it. If this presentation just made you like go wild, you should read that article. It's really good. Um, because that table is there, and this is the table that I reference whenever my teacher like jokingly asked, like, how many technical cards are there? 21 tone equal temperament. And then I can be like, why? There's 165, because I'm just looking at this chart. You know? So, uh, yeah, that is all known and it's all enumerated. And you notice that all the enumerations, of course, have that mirror. So that's why I suspect the coefficient types can be enumerated. Um, then, I guess the last thing I'll talk about really briefly are just uh, cut off equal temperaments. Uh, which have to do with uh, the last number, uh, the last equal tuning that can't create a certain LS scale. And there's a little equation to figure that out, but I don't think I have any time. So basically, just know that that's known and there's a simple multiplication to figure it out. I just used an Excel document where like, I would type the coefficient for L and S in the scale and then generate all this to see like what the possibilities were. So uh, that's basically it. Okay, are there, are there any questions? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, cool. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>